Let me give you a premise. A righteous service for God could never be constructed in the unrenewed mind of man, let alone even imagined. And so the lesson of today is going to impinge upon that, and I want you to first see it set so in the Roman text of uh, chapter 12, verses 14 to 21, not that we go through that in detail. But our pride cannot comprehend life without some form of revenge when we are persecuted. That's the first issue. And of course, uh, verse 14 told us, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. And it is a conundrum to understand blessing them through selfless acts of grace to be a winning combination, if you look at verse 20. For in so doing you will heap burning coals upon his head, it says, in the metaphor of an Egyptian experience of carrying a plate with burning coals on top of it to confess before men that they're ashamed of what they have done. And all of it gives glory to God, verse 21 of that same section. When you overcome evil with good, that gives glory to God. Second, to submit to governing authorities, we're in our last two or three times together, and it seems like it was many weeks ago. Isn't it amazing what two weeks do to you? To submit to governing authorities that chapter 13 introduces to us in the first five verses. To understand a righteous conscience by submission to that is our reward. That's also a conundrum. Verse 5. In doing so, it's one thing to know God established the, them, that is, the uh, governing authorities, as a helper. The word minister there means helper, diakonos, like we get di a deacon from. It's the same word. To protect citizens' good behavior. Uh, also, protecting them in that realm by being an avenger to evil practitioners. Especially awkward when governing authority wages tyranny against innocent citizens. How do you handle that? So we, may, so we must ponder how God used tyrants in Babylon to exhibit his glory through Daniel and his three friends, as an example. Also, by Jesus' example before Pilate, a tyrannical government waging tyranny, not protecting, but God used it to his glory. Difficult things to understand. This is the reason why my premise has several steps in these lessons today. Third, to pay taxes, verses 6 and 7. Chapter 13, to an evil government seems egregiously wrong. And I think all of us would think that way. Even to pay taxes to a good government, which seems always excessive in spending, is a vexing thought. But being right-minded, we're told in these verses to both fear and honor them. In verse 7, it so speaks, and... It speaks because in the business of taxation, the government is God's servant, and it's a different word. It isn't diakonos. It's the word we use for liturgy. God's servants. That's hard to understand. We take up offerings for God's service through the church. God is saying, I'm taxing you through government for my service. Honor them. Give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. How was that posited? It was according to taxation. Was it not when Jesus spoke those words? So for us to get a hold of what's being said there is a little difficult. Fourth, we find the binding of law to love. Verse 9. 
There's a strong binding of law to love. In order to exercise it righteously, as you see in verses 8 to 10, for example, any outstanding debt compromises the full expression of love toward a neighbor. And this example is the only one that's given here, but it is that we should understand that. <laughs> so as we summarize uh, my premise, and I'm going to do that because there's three others that need to hear that, <laughs> that premise is a righteous service for God could never be constructed in the unrenewed mind of man let alone even imagined. And so the first was that, that group of verses at the end of chapter 12 that said to us that we should uh, not think about some form of revenge when we're persecuted. We are to bless. And by blessing, uh, we uh, put those coals of fire upon his head as is to shame him, and uh, that which he intended for evil against us is turned into good. I, it's, a, it's a marvelous concept. Uh, in my study this week, I was reading through MacArthur's notes on these, and he says there's four forms of government. Our officials, the national, state, local officials, the family, mm -hmm. the church, mm -hmm. and, and of course our subjection to God. Yeah. But, and I never thought of these passages in relation to those not, things. Not only we tend to think of of our national and local. State. Sure, we're talking about civil authority because the con yeah. when God constructed these institutions on earth. He instituted the family first and he put the government second to, because Cain and Abel were the representatives by which we find that necessary, right? And so second, we submit to the governing authorities uh, because they are a helper and uh, we remember that even an evil government, God knows how to use that even in that paradigm because he used it in the days of Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar uh, he used it indeed to show his power, even though the government would wage tyranny against the innocent. Um, we are not to uh, ponder whether we are fully innocent when the government wages its decrees against us. Uh, and so we live underneath the tyranny of bad government, I think, uh, increasingly in this time. And we're going to have to deal with that in these days ahead. So how are we going to respond? Because it, indeed, as I said, and these others who came in need to hear, the first time it is to, in, in the taxation, uh, it is exercised uh, uh, as a, the taxing agent, the government, is God's servant, and the word is liturgical and not diaconal. The first time the messenger up in verse uh, uh, for uh, the government is a helper, a minister, a, a deacon, as it were. But here in this latter verse, as we're talking about taxes, uh, we're talking about taxation. They are serving the purpose as God's servant. It's almost uh, has a religious flavor to it. And uh, we need to try to ponder that. So fear and honor them, it says in verse 7 of chapter 13. And then fourth, as we look at the binding law of love, and you don't often think of law as being juxtaposed to love, because under grace we've been taught that law has been fulfilled, but the law has not gone away. It's a righteous law. And in order to exhibit full love unto your neighbor, one of the first things he gives as an example is you don't want to be indebted to him because you can't express full love if you're in debt to him or he in debt to you. It's a constraining thing to the perfection of love. Well, perfect love fulfills God's love for it originates from a moral reflection of the heart. And we know that's true. 
And when empowered by the Holy Spirit, it never harms one's neighbor, it says in verse 9. The Holy Spirit uh, is essential. So don't let any form of indebtedness remain outstanding that would squelch the work of the Holy Spirit. And as a starter, perfecting that love, make sure you're not indebted. And never forget there is a very highest form of perfected love, which is not spoken to here, but it's known in John 13, 34. Love the brethren, how? As I have loved you, not as you love yourself. That's a much higher standard of love. In conclusion, and to assess today's lesson that we will begin in verse 11 of chapter 13, we're now to think of ourselves as a bondservant should think of himself. How do you uh, understand yourself as a bondservant of Christ as being your Lord? Now remember this book is filled with, and the New Testament is filled with, Lord, Lord, and Lord. 700 times the word is used. How many times was it that Savior is used? 11. 17. That's a big difference. So where is the emphasis? Submission. On the Lord. And I think we need to keep that in mind. What does Lord mean in its... Uh, Greek interpretation. The word is master. He's our master. Well, if we're in bond service to our master, how is that played out? And we're going to study that today. And, and it carries with it a weight, a spiritual weight of how to, as Philippians 2.12 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you're saved, how do you work out your salvation? Live it out. That's what, it's, that's what it means. Surely, sanctify. Your imputed righteousness came at the time of what? At the time of your first salvation, when it started. And we forget the package of imputed righteousness. We just kind of, what does imputed mean? We were reckoned righteous in Christ and we live accordingly. How do you do that? He says, I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will empower you to do it. So we are looking at that issue in this study. Let's uh, first remember uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21, and I'm gonna read that as we uh, begin, because it just juxtaposes directly into this passage. Therefore, if any man in, is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled. He reconciled, he made it right. He reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is our ministry? It's going to be that same ministry. Ministry of reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were entreating, through, talking through us. How does he talk through us? By the power of the Spirit. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If you are reconciled to God, how do you be reconciled to God? These verses are outlining it. And so let's take a quick look as we begin this lesson as how that plays out. How do we see ourselves as a bondservant? What does it mean to be a bondservant? How can you be at full liberty in Christ and be a bondservant? Good question. You see, these things are also so oxymoronic to our way of thinking in the secular mind. 
that you cannot think them through in the secular mind. You can only think them through through the wisdom of God that has been revealed to us. And so as we begin chapter 14, we're going to talk about the principles of conscience. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Verses 11 to 14 is called to sanctified living in order to be prepared for God's final work in his saving grace. That is the glorification of his people, his children. Once saved, you are in the season of his promised return. And we're going to see that in the Greek as we move into this lesson. Will you be properly dressed for it? Will you be found having pursued your imputed righteousness that we talked about and revealed in Revelation 22 by the literal translation of that passage in 2211, which says, the one who is holy still keeps himself holy. When we began this study some months ago, we talked about legalism versus antinomianism. And here we are bringing back that subject. So, verse 11. Correction. Verse 1. <laughs> the church body is a tapestry of mature and immature Christians both growing together upon the foundation of saving faith. Each is given spiritual gifts by God's spirit, but each carrying a greater or lesser degree of moral understanding of what an emancipated bondservant is free to do. What is an emancipated bondservant? I couldn't hear that, could the rest of you? Was he right? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so deaf. <clears throat> I didn't get a chance, and that's the reason why I stumbled there just a minute ago, to take you through verses 11 and 14 at the conclusion of this chapter, because we didn't touch on that two weeks ago, did we? I don't think we did, so I better back up before I hit chapter 14 and, and get verses 11 and uh, through 13 done. So let's look at 11. 13, 11. And this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. My subject matter about Cairo's time is embedded in this. And this do, it says, why all the stress on behavior? This question is posed in light of God's revealed truth. Knowing, and knowing is the word I know, and it means that the revealed truth, not the experiential truth. So this is revealed truth to us. Knowing the time, the kairos, the season of a period of time. This is not chronos, this is not chronological time. There's a season of time. The end times is the season of time. Salvation is not just one time, a hope for promise, but carries the evidential weight of it only to those who are awake and live it. Make it experiential by following the commandments of Christ. It is already the hour, it is high time if you please, for you to awaken from sleep. When imputed righteousness is given, you can't be asleep. Most of us have interpreted that as a gift to us with no reflection upon what our service to God is. That's not rational to the scripture. That's the reason why this word, Lordship Salvation, which came out of MacArthur's mouth, I think, years ago, 
found traction. It is already high time for you to awaken from sleep. In context, that is a call to never lethargically rest, but to work out effectually your salvation with fear and trembling that we talked about in Philippians 2. Don't be found indifferent to eternal values and the contemplation of your salvation and sit on your laurels. Being placed within the season of our salvation finds us indebted to the movement of the chronological time. <coughs> Hear me there. Being placed within the season of our salvation finds us indebted to the movement of chronological time in that season. Until, it says, our salvation is fully realized. That debt carries with it an urgent attitude for it is nearer, that means the chronological time is telling us it's getting nearer to us than when we first believed. That's scriptural right by quotation from verse 11. We've seen that as we looked at Romans 8.23 and we didn't stumble over that, did we? I mean, it's pretty clear when he said and not, well, Paul speaking, and not only this, but we also ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. That's the movement of chronological time through the Kairos, or through the season of time. We are becoming more and more eagerly anticipating our full redemption. Being alert is spiritual vigilance to being useful as a bondservant of Christ and not being tempted or deceived by the flesh to deny him before others. If you look at verse 12, now he's writing to the Romans. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. You see the movement of chronological time. Let us therefore lay aside the, needs of dark, the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Spiritual war is, a, is an inevitable. And especially since Christ is physically absent and Satan is free to roam. And as we look into the season of time that we're talking about, we're looking at the time when Satan's going to be cast out of heaven. And his power on earth is going to increase. That's what Revelations tells us, right? <clears throat> Understanding of the conflict is scripturally, metaphorically here, understood as night versus day between darkness and light. And the focus battle was at Jesus Christ's first event when he engaged sin and death on the cross and set in motion the final battle, which we're in at this point, the coming of the day of the Lord as the scripture alludes to it, his second advent. Therefore, saved man, the product of the first work is advised, the night is almost gone, and that he should look forward to the coming day. His preparation empowers the saved to lay aside the deeds of darkness. This is an allusion to a willful repentance for fleshly sin. And put on the armor of light, this dressing that you put on the new man contains the armor of light as is explained in Ephesians 6, a common group of verses for us. And the outcome is guaranteed. What is that outcome? Let's look at 1 John. I'll look at 1 John for you. Verses 7. Six and seven, which say this. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It's pretty clear. 
what is being spoken of here. So looking at verse 13, let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing, and this is nighttime stuff, not carousing in drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. And so as you look at verse 13, we do this so as a be, as an obedient Christian, we behave properly, is, is the words that are used here. A lifestyle that is itself a witness to our salvation. We do it properly. And to emphasis, the works of darkness are listed as well-known examples to the Romans. And if you go back and think about what you know about Rome, these are the things that empowered the darkness of Rome. When you find the gifts that are given in Romans, it is to the church that needs those gifts. When you see this list here, these are the things that they were combating in the darkness of Rome. And so let's look at them quickly. Carousing, it, is an, it envisions a, a worldly celebration and is spoken of in terms of a military term because they were really into this, the athletic and the military victories which they uh, revered. Dark drunkenness, and it, and it speaks of habitual intoxication, and this was known and practiced, was it not, in Rome. It was really a problem. Sexual promiscuity, and this is not the word that we see so often as pornea, but this is coiti, coitus. In our English language, and it has to do with bedroom affairs, multiple bedroom affairs in their promiscuity. They spent all day chasing women and all night. That's Rome. You remember Jude and you remember Second Peter? What were they saying that these godless ones that were entering your congregation were prone to do? They were greedy and they were sensual. And so it was in the Roman day and in the Roman church having to face these things. Sensuality really talks about shameless excess of pleasure. They were combining the drug culture with the sex culture, with the sport culture. Uh, it sounds kind of like America. This shameless excess was often and is often connected directly to sexual immorality also. They kind of go hand in hand. And the latter two is strife. Now, what happens, do you remember my definition of socialism? I'll bring it back because it fits to this. Socialism is made for and by schizophrenics. It is a form of pleasure and profit for the parasites. And it is a pathway to paranoia for the powerful. What is happening at the top of the Roman government? Et tu brute? What does that reflect? Strife, persistent, contentious animosity among those who were at the top. Jealousy, selfish ambition to the very height of it. So this listing in verse 13 is the night behavior. We're progressing toward the day as Christians. The day is open bright upon us, put on the clothing of light. Don't walk in these pathways. Don't get caught up in them. But what was the church brought out of? The culture of that stuff. And so was the culture of the Corinthian church. 
It was brought out of the culture of that Greek Macedonian lifestyle of Eastern Europe. And so when we get into the study of 1 Corinthians and then the carnal church, you'll see the carnal church is doing what? Bringing its culture into the church. Paul is saying, don't do that. Verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So having presented his case in verses 12 and 13, Paul now makes a reverse order and shows us the strength of that action. It is the new man behaving Christ-like. Yes, he must, yes, he must war against evil using God's protective armor. But he needs to make a full heart commitment to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That includes the final step, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And in the Greek, that's telling us, give no forethought to plan ways to consummate lustful desires, which are brought to mind by the flesh. Do you ever have lustful desires brought on by the flesh? Those haven't gone away. And it isn't just sexual. Now, having already jumped the guardrails in chapter 14, <laughs> what is an emancipated bondservant free to do? Verse 1, chapter 14. Sorry to backtrack like that, but somehow I got mixed up in my pages. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. These are church matters. Paul says it's imperative that all Christians accept, that is to receive to oneself, it's speaking in the middle voice, this is an action on our part, anyone who is weak, and in the Greek, again, that means without strength, asthenia, the Greek word, in understanding God's full truth. And it speaks to their faith, their conviction. Engaging this obligation comes with a warning. Never quarrel over another Christian's convictions. For it is fruitless, to argue over personal opinions. For that is the process by which we indirectly pass unjust judgment. And it loses the loving relationship we're called to. You profit from that thought? Verse 2, one man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Now what was going on in that society? What is the Roman church? It's a combination of who? I'll tell you there's three races, so which two? Jews and Jew and Gentile. You're finding a large amount of Jew and Gentile people within the Roman church. Okay? Keeping that in mind, we introduce things that are conflicting in their past culture, and they're abrasive if you are not careful. What was it for the Galatian church? Ten years before. The Jewish people forcing upon the Gentile Christian, you must first go through circumcision, follow the ceremonial law. And Paul said, no. 
So let's look at it here from the standpoint of later time. The first example was the issue, was an issue in that day. To eat meat, the Jewish law had refused pork and other things, had it not. And its methods of butchering and cooking were so detailed as to be frustrating at the least. If not condemning to the mind of the, of the Gentile. Marketplace meats had most often been sacrificed to pagan idols. That was going on in Rome. It was certainly going to be seen in Corinth as we study in the weeks ahead. And so both Jewish and Gentile believers had reservations about these things. How would you feel today if all the meat in your, in your marketplace had come off of a, of a sacrifice to a pagan idol? Would it um, constrain you in thought? Well, it did some. Peter had formerly been emphatically counseled by God. Now we're talking about Peter here. Counseled by God on these issues in years before. And we're looking at Cornelius, the Gentile centurion, the Roman prelate in Israel, to whom Peter was sent. And I must understand in that society, that the Jews wanted to have nothing to do with those terrible Romans. Right? And so Peter, being counseled by God before bringing the gospel to Cornelius, this is an uncomfortable Jewish-Gentile interface with religious baggage hanging all over it. We read about it in Acts 10. That God in the age of grace had removed the Jewish dietary laws, opened the door. And so we need to hear Paul's writing to Timothy and then look at Acts 10. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3, I want you to see that this is an ongoing issue in, even in the later days of the apostles. 1 Timothy 4 and verses of one to three, and this juxtaposes even upon us. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to the deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared on their own conscience. I am tired of being gaslighted because it's butting up against my conscience. In this day and age, are you tired of it? It's pushing my conscience, as with a branding iron. And then it says, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. Ooh, does that echo? <laughs> Which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. And that was the issue with Peter. Peter, how many times did God have to say it to him? We're going to read that in just a minute. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified, it has been set apart by means of the word of God and prayer. So let's look at Acts 10, verses 13 to 16, which is the subject of Peter here. And we look at these short little statements. And a voice came to Peter, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Here's a Christian Jew still practicing Jewish customary food laws. Right? And again a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times, it says in verse 13. The, there is no exclamation point in the language. 
So how do you make it emphatic? You repeat it three times. And so that's what happened to Peter, okay? So now as Peter went to see Cornelius, Cornelius was zealous for God, but he didn't know him. He didn't know Jesus. But he was zealous for God. And he didn't have the understanding. As a Gentile. And so, this liberated Jew and Gentile Christian to be has been convicted by God that he may eat all things it says here but the weak of faith are reticent and act and eat only vegetables that doesn't portend judgment is in order the work of God is the greater issue if you look at verse 20 of verse 14 do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. Now, what do you think happened to a <clears throat> humble Roman that was zealous for God but did not yet fully know Jesus Christ? When Peter, a Jew who has just been convicted of his behavior concerning foods, is sent to give him the gospel. What do you think is going on in that assembly? Is there going to be feasting and celebration? I think there's going to be a great feasting and celebration. And Peter and his crew weren't ready to face that until they had faced God's command about food. Don't offend Cornelius by emphasizing your food laws over the work of Christ, Peter. And Cornelius, not knowing all that's behind this, is kind of the innocent, weak Christian in his new birth. I suspect on his table was pork. It was one of the preferred meats of the Gentile world. Um, Indeed, all you had to do was look at Jesus, go over in to Gadara and see what was going on. What happened when the evil spirit was cast into the pigs? Where are all those pigs? Deviled ham. Gentile world. Deviled ham. Deviled ham. <laughs> <laughs> into the water, huh? <laughs> Pretty well put. Uh, anyway. So we see that. Verse 13. Verse 3, excuse me. One man has, uh, let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Augustine put it in these words, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Pretty succinct. There is a faulty motivation when one who eats regards with contempt, that means abhors or sees as worthless, the one who does not eat. As equally, the one who does not eat is prone to judge or condemn his brother who eats. And so the verse is saying, follow God's example and love one another, for God has accepted you both. Verse 4, and we'll conclude. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The principle is cast under a broader net. 
and we need to see this. It's a stinging and rhetorical cast against any who dare judge the servant of another. And the word servant here is, is literally the domestic servant. One who belongs to another master. Spiritually, we're butting up against bond service to Jesus Christ. Spiritually, both are in bond service to him. So Paul says, all who so judge are indeed amiss and cannot stand righteously if they practice these things. But indeed his master, that is the Lord, direct quote, will enable him to stand as God alone is able to empower good in his children. Consider the lesson herein. Sin is contagious. Righteousness is, righteousness is never contagious. Evil evolves. Good never evolves. It's God's gift because only God is good. Our amillennial theological friends in the Protestant denominations miss this point. Their whole theology is that Christ will come back when man has worked out the goodness of his salvation. I'm sorry, I don't see that in Scripture. I see evil evolving, and I see Romans 1 categorizing how that works. I also want you to hear what Haggai said. You have to be a little bit into the language of the Old Testament to understand some of this, but profit from it if you can. Haggai 2 verses 11 to 14. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now the Lord is dealing here. It's Yahweh. Ask now the priests for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold or cooked food, wine or oil or other food, Will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then Haggai said, If one who is unclean from the corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered and said, It will become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. I'll let you digest that. You can go study if you please. God's gift of imputed righteousness will sustain his children under the supervision of the Spirit and his righteous discipline of them, as Hebrews 12, 5 to 8 tells us. So we're beginning to see a shift in our thoughts to impugn directly the bondservant of Jesus Christ in chapter 14. How much liberty do we have when we are set free? We need to understand it. If we exercise it according to legalism, we will offend and break a bond of love. So how, and it's put upon us to do this. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer, and after we're finished, if we'd move these chairs and tables, as we previously said.
Father, your gracious God has given us a, a lot to think about today. O oh Lord, by the appropriation of your spirit, may we understand it. For it is profitable for our walk. And it is a glory to your call that we may abide in you and you in us and be fruitful. May the fruit of the spirit be shown in our lives that we may love one another with that perfect love. Destined, if necessary, to give our life to the benefit of our brother and sister in Christ. But also in the daily walk of life that we not become useless servants by showing forth the old culture, the desires of selfish pattern of living. Father, bless us today uh, with the understanding of your promise that you are with us through this season of time as it chronologically draws near to your coming. May we, O oh Lord, be more perfected because we know you better and do not escape the great provision of life that we are free in you but not given license to harm our brother. Come soon, we pray, in the strong name of Jesus Christ.